during the dinner, you, Margie, said mm -hmm. something to the effect of like, I hope you're not planning on proposing to me tonight. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Nice, Margie. Nice, sweet, perfect. <laughs> Welcome back to Dear Shandy, listeners. We have something very special in store for you today. I think this is a pretty cool experiment that we have. It's not an experiment. It's a conversation with someone very special. And I know all our guests here on Dear Shandy are very special, whether they're callers or Love Fest guests or experts or whomever. But we'll never again have a guest of this caliber because <laughs> today <laughs> our guest is Andy's ex fiance who also happens to be a clinical psychologist. It's really two for the price of one. Our guest today is Margie. Margie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> um, folks, do not try this at home. <laughs> Very dangerous experiment. It's, no, the point of today is to show that it doesn't have to be dangerous. <laughs> That's right. Because I right. have always felt so welcomed by Margie, which is more than I can say for a lot of exes, exes. <laughs> yeah, I haven't always felt welcomed by Margie. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of Andy's exes may have felt as welcomed as you, but I, you know, Andy <laughs> really? chose well. I have a, he I have chose a hard well. time imagining, I have a hard time imagining you not being warm to one of his girlfriends. Well, I mean, Andy, isn't it fair to say that you didn't introduce me to all of your exes? Because I think that you actually... You you knew I would like Charlene because you knew I introduced they you to one. I think Megan, right? Yeah, she came to a, a party once, and you guys got along, right? Yeah, totally. I could see you guys getting along. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah, totally. But I feel like you introduced me to Charlene because you were like, "Look what I found," and well, it, and, you, and you knew it, and you knew it was good, and I knew it was good, and you, and also. <laughs> By the way, I credit I credit all of your positive development to Charlene. I mean, every good thing that you've developed in the last five years, Charlene gets credit for. So, you know, I oh inherently my goodness. I inherently you can see why I'm a fan of Margie. Uh -huh. <laughs> I inherently like her because, you know, you're you're so much nicer. And even though you're still neurotic, you're not as neurotic. So these are all things <laughs> these are all things that I credit to Charlene. That is, is, that, so is that fair, Andy? I mean, that's very fair. Right. I, think I don't you're 100 know if it's fair. Right. That's very generous of you to say. I talk, so, so to me, Margie, that's funny to hear because, you know, the Andy, the only Andy I know is the Andy that I've known since I met him. So if he's changed in any way, it's hard well, for me to Well, to be I fair, don't. you know, Margie gets a lot of credit for making me the person I am today as well. Of course. Oh. But, but, but I'm not giving you full, like, positive credit. Yeah, I was it's also say. a lot of horrible things <laughs> that happened that made me stronger. Like, if it doesn't kill you, you know, it yeah, makes right. you stronger. Yeah. I was like, oh, medicine. wait, wait, whatever doesn't kill you oh, yeah. makes you stronger. <laughs> but the point me. is, Margie did not kill me. I was like, you're a robot. Yeah. She came that close. Terrible. She came close. Did not kill me. <laughs> well, that brings us nicely to your relationship because I. I wanted to, we don't have to go super deep because, you know, what you shared is is what you shared. And I'm a big believer in that being your experience and your story. But I think it's, it's too easy and too often people look back on any kind of relationship that ended, especially one where you were engaged or married or, or just together for a really long time. It's easy to look back on that and be like, that was a terrible experience, that person is X, Y, Z, like all the negative adjectives. When really you were together for a while, you shared something very special. And so I thought it would be fun if you're comfortable and you do not have to, but if you have any fun anecdotes, fun memories, and then later on, I do want to get to the whole, like the dynamic of how you are now, how you became friends. But for now, are there any fun memories you guys have from when you were together? I mean, the first few weeks yeah. were all fun. Weren't every every time I saw you it was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the it first was some six adventure. Months, just... I want to say, like when we were living, you were in New York and I was in San Francisco. It yeah. was very storybook, right? It I was. Mean, it was truly magical. Yeah. Like yeah. we really. I mean, I, I could say this to you because mm -hmm. see, again, do not try this at home. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, th again, this is why we it worked. Margie, you're clearly not a jealous person. 
No. I'm not a jealous person. I once was. This is something I've worked on because I've realized that why be jealous? It doesn't help you at all. It doesn't serve you at all. Margie, were you ever a jealous person? No, no. But I think that it it really helps to be in a new and wonderful relationship to not, I think if I would be jealous in the past, it wouldn't be of a person. It would be of the relationship. Like, I, I want a relationship well like that. But the well fact said. that I have a good relationship really frees me up to enjoy your good relationship. So it's all good. Mar- Margie, I can vouch is a very not jealous person. So even when you guys were together, not jealous. No. As a matter of fact, the only time in my life that I had extreme jealousy and I learned from it was with her. Really? I yeah. think I'm like too. This is she so, double crossed me. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> I think that I have like it in some way. Even though I'm insecure about other things, there's a kind of glitch in my makeup that I'm like, why would anybody cheat on me? Why would? Why should I be jealous? I, I really, it's like a blind spot. I, I think that you know, I probably should be more insecure and jealous in relationships than I have been, but I just kind of feel no. like. You know, I disagree. No. I, well, I feel like people are people aren't going to leave. The times that Margie was the most jealous was when I was spending time with myself. Mm. She was jealous of me <laughs> spending time with me. Really? Yeah, she got really pissed off about that. Margie, do you confirm? Um, that's a really really interesting way of putting it. I think that you're probably right. I think that this is we're looking at. You know, this is almost twenty years ago, sixteen years ago. I think that the the biggest shift that I've made from the time of Andy to where I am now is just being so much more content with my alone time and recognizing the importance of being in a relationship where each person gets to be their own self. And that's uh, like th- yes. that's like the secret to my relationship now. It's like the the little the glue that keeps it all going, but that's not where agree. I was. That's not where I was when we were together. I really wasn't. The first 6 months of that relationship Magical. was as good as remember though, like our first 6 months was great, but I had never been in love before yeah. when I met Margie. So our first 6 months was like at, it was storybook to the yeah. te- and Can and you- she was really emotional too. I just have to add Margie was unbelievably emotional. So it was like, not only was it amazing, but like when she was into it, she was like crying and staring in my eyes. And like, it was like intense, like crazy. Margie, do you, do you agree or do you can defend yourself? I don't, I don't think of myself that way because I am i don't know myself to be, a, I couldn't be any different, but it's funny to hear that. I, I mean, I, I, mean remember, Andy, I it, still have like, oh my God, I still have the mixtape you made me when we first met. I have like, you know, for all my past relationships this is tmi but i have like memory boxes of all of them and for for yours like i have the mixtape you made me when we were dating you also wrote me poems you know what i mean like you were being very romantic and the first six months like it was andy was in new york and i was also falling in love with new york city because i was coming out to visit him and i ended up moving to new york city partly you know in large part because of the the sales job that Andy did on New York City, like giving me the Woody Allen, you know, here's where Woody <laughs> Allen did the I love you, I love you and Annie Hall. Oh, like, yeah. and, and walking over the Brooklyn Bridge and going to the River Cafe. I just, I was completely bowled over by New York City. So after we broke up, Andy moved back to New York City and to his great frustration, I'm sure, I followed him because I wanted to live in New York City. You know, and that was your fault. Well, what's what's it? What's actually interesting is when I got back to New York City, I kept thinking to myself, like, I'm going to get her back. Like, <laughs> I'm going to get her back. And you know, for like, you remember thinking that? I don't remember. I know I was. So even remember- though she broke your heart, you wanted her. I was like, I'm going to get her back. I was. Do we so need to sore. talk about like, I- like? Do we need to? touch upon why you were so you angry. guys don't need to do anything you can do whatever you want whatever you basically margie just to cut to the chase <laughs> we weren't doing well let's be honest it was our relationship was, was can you identify in- what like why was it so magical and then why wasn't it it's because we question. were 27 years old and we no, no we weren't we weren't you were 25 and you were 24 and i was 25 when we and met, then when, when it we ended, so you were yeah. twenty five and I was twenty six. So not even yeah, there yeah, around. We were kids. We were living yeah, in we a were we were living in a studio apartment. Okay, there were <laughs> the only way we could have an argument was for one of us to go in the bathroom. That was the only door to close. <laughs> we were yeah, living, it, was it was a, a small studio. A, yeah, it was a beautiful studio apartment. I will say, but it yeah. was one room. We were 
we didn't know what we were doing. We were kids. And, you know, there were all kinds of things like you remember you were like going through all that stress with the stock market. Like you went into this like deep depression and it just freaked me out. You know, like I hadn't dealt with any of my own stuff, like a father with depression, all of a sudden Andy's depressed. And I was like, get me out of here. I can't deal with any of this. But we were just way too young to be in the situation that we were on the marriage track. We were living together. And well, it's felt, very I felt serious like the relationship. Whole, the whole thing was very like play. It was like a play ma- marriage. Oh, so it was yeah. what you like imagined. Playing yes. make-believe. So would you say that you had the kind of compatibility that you had never found before and you were like, this is what love is. This is what m- what becomes marriage. And therefore yeah. you invested in it even though there might have been these cracks. Yes. I had a picture of Margie on my desk at work <laughs> that I got made fun of incessantly <laughs> about. <laughs> Literally a week after I met her, framed on my desk. Okay, so this was serious. Photo, that's so cute. I don't think I ever knew that. You didn't like the photo. You claimed that you looked like you had a mustache, but I didn't (laughs) think that. God Almighty! I didn't think that. I thought she looked beautiful. That's so cute. Pre like photo phones. Oh, I had literally like a plastic. Today that would be like it would be your screensaver. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Back then it was on my desk. Oh, so embarrassing. So anyway. I would like it to be I'm stated just, for the record that I have many flaws, but I do not have a mustache. She does not have a mustache. Do she okay. never has had I a mustache. It was a shadow okay. issue. There but was no when we met, but, 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 but I will say that when we met, I hadn't been shaving my legs or my armpits. Remember? <laughs> San Francisco, 1997. The hair was growing on the armpits, but not on, on the lips. But anyway, yeah, there was a little bit of uh, it was okay. I, I was okay with it. Anyway, it was it was like a make believe. We were in like a, a romance novel. It wasn't. And we real. also had. I mean, really, it was real, but it wasn't real, real. Well, we had a really fun time exploring California, also, and we did yeah. go to like the redwoods and to Oregon, and we went on a lot of adventures, and it was really exciting. I think that it was really fun, and if we hadn't tried to make it into let's be married for the rest of our lives. It might have been, a, you know, I don't know what it would have happened. I'm not saying that we would have stayed together because I don't think we would have. But I think it was just an enormous amount of pressure on the relationship to be in. I actually, I have a question about that then. Why? Why? You know, you're so young. Why do you feel the need to get engaged, especially when there are issues? I presumably when you did get engaged, there were issues. You know what I mean? Like, why? Is that just a thing of youth? Like, oh, we get along so well, it's like the next step up. Like, we we have to level up. Let's get married. Do you think that that played a part? Because I do feel like a lot of people just seem to feel like that kind of, like, we have to get married. Like, we I feel did. old. I did. I you felt did. that way. Well, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning just a little bit of the chronology that, you know, Andy and I, you know, he moved out to California. We lived together for about a year after dating for six months and then we broke up and it was a ugly ugly breakup the details of which andy we don't have to get into but if you want to summarize we can but put it, put, it, put it this way it it ended with me standing in the street blocking a guy's car at like 11 p.m at night challenging him <laughs> to a fight <laughs> yes. a guy who i wasn't cheating on andy with but like i was about to <laughs> and it, it was getting it was getting murky it was getting murky yeah. um it was it was not pretty it was not pretty for it was bad and so we didn't so you moved back to new york and then we broke up and then mm-hmm. i moved to new york a year and a half later and we gradually became friends again mm-hmm. and then maybe a year after that am i getting this right we started dating again okay so from what I gather, I, I know this much. Your relationship is two main chunks. There's San Francisco and New York, which is years later, and New York is what ends up with the engagement. Mm-hmm. But for San Francisco, Margie breaks your heart. You, uh, want, you're kind of depressed in the city, and you end up at moving back to New York <laughs> all dejected after of threatening a guy in your driveway. <laughs> Not my driveway, in an actual, like in the middle of a street and in, in oh, the wow. center of okay, San but so, but in terms of San Francisco, can we wrap on San Francisco? Is there anything else you want to add before we move um, on to New York? <laughs> they're actually interestingly, we were talking about I, I was writing poems for Margie, 
<laughs> That's very sweet. And, and one of the reasons I was writing those poems is because one of the first, during the first time I visited Margie, mm-hmm. or actually was it the first, I think it was the first week I was actually living there, um, she took me to a, a poetry reading, which is apparently thing pe- something people did in San Francisco <laughs> back then. They may still do it. I'm really getting a real clear picture of San Francisco yeah. back then. Yeah, back then, right? yeah 97 yeah. San Francisco was is not all it's cracked up yeah, to Yeah, and I so, worked in a bookstore and my friends were literary types. Yeah, so she, poetry reading made sense. But I remember this is very eventful. So she advised me this poetry reading. It's kind of like the first like legitimate date like with like her friends and like you know an actual event that we went to okay and it was kind of like it was like this room was bright and there was like three rows of chairs and and the the person on the stage was like like four or five feet in front of the front row okay and uh so anyway it's like like a full hour into this thing and i gotta be (laughs) honest it's torture Their poetry wasn't as good as yours. It's, I mean, even if it was good poetry, it would have been borderline torture, but it was very, very mediocre. Margie, do you disagree? I don't really remember. I can't really remember. I just remember it was a very small, crowded apartment. So, yeah. So, so we're in there and like, it's a long time and it's like an hour. And I had had like a really big uh, burrito before we went in there. <laughs> And, I can already and tell I, where this is going. And I felt the beginnings of a, a problem. You haven't learned your lesson, by the way. You still really love very oh large gosh. burritos. I love I love large burritos. Every time I'm bean. in a Mexican you love place. love large bean burritos. That's correct. I always go bean because I, I don't eat meat. But um, when I every time they give me an option, they could be like, it's usually like eight or 12 inches. Like I could literally say like 12 or 70 inches. I'm going 70. Like I'll take whatever the biggest burrito they have. Oh, and the burritos Always. out there are so good too. That's like the only yeah, good the thing Mich- about San Francisco. Yeah, they're famous. The Mission Burritos are famous for them. So anyway, so I'm sitting there and I got problems. And I know that there's a lot more poetry to be read here. And um, I'm, I'm feeling a little worried. So in the front of the room, like right next to the stage, there's a little bathroom. And that's the bathroom. And that's it. That's my option. Wait, you have to walk through. I got to walk through about 10 people on my row and walk right next to the person reading poetry oh. and go in that bathroom. Oh, that's my worst nightmare. So actually. Who's, who's isn't that? Oh, wait, yeah. how do you well, say that? Well, in who's general, I have. Isn't that the worst? I have a very weird. It's not a real phobia, but it, I hate this. I hate it when you're in any bar or restaurant or just venue situation people where people to watch can you. see you. Yeah, yeah I want to just be seen like. If I'm going to be seen, I just want to like just disappear down a hallway. <laughs> no one needs to see me open the door that leads to a room with a toilet. You know, that's a very, <laughs> it's totally true. That's a very a female thing. Like I've had several girlfriends who've had the exact oh, I, same thing. They're yes. like, I don't like people knowing what I'm doing yes. over here. I get that. Totally. It makes sense. Yeah. So, so anyway. So this is like this crime. Is, yeah. This is bad. You have to walk right next to the person who's performing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so what's about to happen is not something that you can, you know, like just some little thing you can kind of cover up. <laughs> it's going to be rough. So, so I go, I, I'm like, I, I can't do this. I can't wait. There's no intermission. It's just like endless poetry that's mediocre. So I'm like, I am going to have to make this happen. Like oh I, I'm trying to make a good I, first. I forgot all of this. Oh my god. I'm trying. I'm trying to make a good impression because I bear. I don't know Margie that well. We're still in like the early, early, early honeymoon. I don't know okay. her friends. You're in like the pre bodily functions. Oh, phase. way before. <laughs> like it's not even a conception that anything comes out of any hole other than my mouth. So, so I'm going. I'm thinking to myself, I got to do this. It's got to be. There's. There's, this is happening. Did you not occur to you to try and leave the place and just go to like and what Starbucks? search for like be like I'm leaving and like go down like five floors and like walk around a city okay, I'm not fair. familiar with okay. and go to like and plus probably, by the time you th- thought about that it was probably getting desperate. I don't think you understand how desperate it was. <laughs> okay. Like it was past the point of finding a bathroom. It was oh, at the point gosh. of like I may just do this right here or I can actually do it in a room where you know okay there's a there's a bowl so. So I went, I, I, you know, I was like, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, I'm just going to go quickly. You're like stepping around. You know, I got to take a leak, you know, whatever. Okay. Uh, leak. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, you know, I go through like five, six, seven people. Excuse me, excuse me, you know. And I go to this little door. I close the door and I'm like, hey, you know what? This is going to happen. 
And so I knew like I would do like a very rapid mercy flush. I knew exactly how I was going to go down. <laughs> I think I knew, I, I think I was, I would really thought I was going to get away with it. So, so What's I, a mercy flush. Mercy flush is like where you flush before it just simmers there. Like you flush the second it, you know, you, you drop down. I just learned something new. Yeah, splash down, flush, like no, no, no gap. So, um, so anyway, I got it all planned out. It's totally cool. Okay. So I, I, I put down a, a real, you know, it's a tremendous piece of work. <laughs> We're talking like, it's like a, you could probably hit a baseball. Like you could, you could actually make contact and drive a baseball okay. with what I did in there. All right. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> too graphic. Too much, too much. So, so, uh, I go to flush and nothing, <laughs> nothing. Okay. Nothing. Like not even, it's like a novelty flusher. <laughs> it's like just for sure. Yeah, it's like a joke. It's like, wah, wah. No, there's no connection between the flusher, the, 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 the tank, the toilet. It's the all hook. a joke. It's unhooked. It's unhooked. There's not, I can't even hook. So I'm like, oh my God, this is a disaster. So I go in the tank. Did, I lift, wait, did you think about just leaving it? No. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. The next person in there is going to know exactly who went in there. It's not like a mystery. Like it's a okay. small room. Okay. So I open the tank. I start fiddling with the thing and trying to hook it on. There's nothing happening. It's a, there's nothing. There's no water in the tank. It's like rusted. It's a, I don't know why this toilet is there. It's like a torture device. Like it's it's like a joke. So so I'm so I'm like this is this is this can't happen. I just met this girl. I have to. This has. So I'm thinking. I'm like okay. There's a window to my left. A small window that leads down to the street. And I was like, all right, it's got to be done. So I wrapped my oh hand my with a lot of toilet oh paper God. and I reached oh in. Oh my goodness. And, and the, that's the reason I discussed how, how rigid it was. I was able to take it out in one, <laughs> one handful. Like that was it. It was clean. <laughs> You're lucky it was I op- intact. I, I was totally intact. I opened the window and right out. But you were on the fifth floor. That's correct. It landed on the top of a parked car. Oh my God. And it literally sounded like a bomb went off. So anyway, I washed my hands. Oh my God. I washed my hands. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. Very thoroughly. And um, I got back to my seat and I was like, no, no one's the wiser. I, that well, was, now- I did it. Maybe someone listening to this will be like, there was a shit on the top of my car in 1997. Interestingly (laughs) enough, after that poetry reading was over, we did leave and walk out and, you know, go down the street. And I noticed, but did not alert anyone to the fact that there was a uh, number two on, on the roof of a parked car in front of that building. Wow. See, it's yeah. only, and I've heard this story before. It, it doesn't ever get old, but you know, because you were you were still really trying to make a good impression. So the the extreme anxiety around this whole story as as it happened, no one can imagine how egregious this was for you. You had to do it. Oh, you, no. had, you had no choice. I had no choice. You had I to had do no it. Choice. And and now. And, and it, like all these years later. I mean, later. it feels like the wrong thing to do, but I have to admit in that situation. What would you have done? And no, you're a dick no matter what. You're a dick no matter what. You either leave it in the toilet and you're a dick. You had a to dick. do it. You're, you're martyring yourself. The next person in there is so like, you animal. They're going to know it was me. It wasn't like there was 7,000 people in this yeah. place. And you were they trying to make a good impression me. with my friends. Like the whole thing, you, you couldn't it's, do it. You couldn't leave it. But it's, it's, it's only now when I listen to it like 20, three years later, my God, that I realized that that number two that you threw out the window is essentially what happened to our relationship. It's a metaphor. That's correct. It had had to happen. It had to get thrown out the window. There was nothing else that could be done, right? That's that's poignant. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, On that that note, can we wrap on San Francisco and move to New York? Oh, that's definitely a wrap. That is the bookend. Yes, I mean, I mean, like we had a long break between San Francisco and New York, during which time, I think that Andy reflected back and used to make this quip, which I think is worth mentioning. Like as the relationship was coming to an end in San Francisco, as as many women would probably relate to, like I wasn't interested in having sex anymore. We were kind of done. We were like not 
really connecting anymore. And for Andy, as he later joked about, at, at the end of the relationship, he compared it to, he said a woman at the end of a relationship is done having sex. But a man at the end of a relationship is like a squirrel burrowing nuts for the winter. He's just packing away as many <laughs> nuts as he can get because he never knows how long the winter is going to be. And, and that is really what I remember from the end of the relationship, right? And I mean, I was done and yeah. you were packing away, trying to pack away nuts. Yeah, but I wasn't able to pack away the nuts. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I understand what the nuts are. The nuts are like sex. The bonings. The so numbers. you're just trying to bone her as much as possible and she's trying to... And she's trying to not bone at all. Yeah. But I mean, you, you ended up having no issue boning when you were single. Yeah, but not when I was with her. I had a lot of issues boning when I was with well, her. He didn't, but he didn't know that then. He didn't know that after our He had not yet discovered his prowess. Oh, my God. No, it wasn't until after we broke up. I am curious about your whole New York thing. Yeah, so I, I got back to New York, and <laughs> I was like, I was a mess. <laughs> um, and I was, the first thing I thought was, you know, I'm going to figure out how to get this girl back. Like, I had to even the playing Okay, field. so what was the mindset there, though? Like, she broke your heart. I had never, I was a child. I had never had my heart broken. I had heard about people getting their heart broken. I had seen movies about people getting their heart broken. I was like, ah, you pansy, you can figure this out. Like, I didn't understand what went into getting your heart broken. Yeah. It's no joke. It's yeah. like like worse than death. It's like yeah. being burned alive. And there's so, a unique level of pain when you have not been, you've never been in love and you've never had your heart broken before. The level to which you jump, like, I think everybody knows what we're talking about. Like, when you jump in with both feet, you don't even know what heartbreak is. You don't even imagine it. When it happens, it, the devastation is just, it's, you know, unfathomable. And I think it's, it's because we, yeah, we were so innocent. That's why it, it was so devastating. You know? Yes. Yes. You had no idea that that was a thing that could happen. You and know? you, your heart was, your heart was so open. It was like walking into a battlefield with like a flower. And we and were, were talking like, no, about, that's not how it works. Yeah, we were talking about being married, getting married and being together forever. Like we were kind of thinking that way even after a year. I, right. I couldn't imagine life without her. So oh, okay, suddenly so, she was gone. So actually, so, OK, I, I correct myself. That's actually probably a very natural reaction. You get your heart broken instead of thinking vengeance. Fuck her. You're like. How dare she break my heart? She's wrong. You want to get her back. You want or to you want to get him back. Yes. One of the, either, I'm wrong. Wh whoever it is. Yeah. So yeah. Margie was the breaker upper. So I was the trying to get back together with her. -er. And um, when I got back to the city, the first thing I thought was like, well, I got to figure out how to first get my life in order. And in doing so, make myself look presentable to get her back. Oh, um, I never knew all this. Okay. That's yeah. It's interesting. You're hearing this for the first time, but that was mm -hmm. totally true. You didn't realize that there was a chance that was happening. Come on. Oh, that he was trying to like you, be more impressive. You, for you must have had a hunch that I, I was like thinking about it. I didn't think of it that way. Wow. Well, I was. I was. <laughs> anyway, what happened was, That's and very I'm gonna, sweet. I'm there's something very animalistic about that. It's like you didn't like me the first time. Well, let me like <laughs> prune my feathers and try again. <laughs> well, I knew, I knew that deep down, I knew there was something there that could be salvaged, and I knew it was kind of wrong that we broke up. Hmm. So I knew I, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't like she was like, "Ugh, I'm so sick of you. I'm bored. Goodbye." And I was like, "No, you want me." Those situations never work out. Okay. But this was one of the rare situations where I thought she made the right, the wrong call. Like I really thought we were supposed to be together. So okay. I spent the next, you know, six months to a year, like kind of improving myself. Like I'm gonna get myself, I could get my feet under myself. I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna look good for her, and I'm gonna get her back. Okay. So I did all this stuff. Like I really, I met all sorts of new friends. I, I got a new job. I was, I was like doing well. And then like by the time I kind of felt like I was like really established, and I was also dating a lot of girls. Yeah. I was like. Oh, I don't really want to. I'm. I've, I've sort of exercised that. I don't really want Margie back. I think I'm good. Like I think I've gotten past it, and it was a really good feeling. <laughs> I was just going to ask: um, Were you, either of you in communication at that time? I think very little. I don't like think so. Every... Like not not for the first year. I want to say very little. It okay. was like maybe like 
three communications. Margie, did you feel bad about breaking his heart? I mean, I was dating the guy that he almost beat up in the street. So (laughs) she was not living with him. I wasn't living with him, but I moved to New York and I was still in with him. And Andy and I weren't really in touch that whole first year. I want to say. Yeah. So I was, I, I was a combination of like, I'm totally good. I'm over her and I'm, now I'm embracing how pissed off I am that she's living or she's dating this guy who she's still dating this guy who yeah. she had this thing with in San Francisco. I was like, I'm done. I have totally happily moved on. Mm-hmm. So again, by the way, that was like what you're describing is what a lot of people lot probably of people, do, but it shows that it works. Like if you work to improve yourself and like really invest in your own hobbies, your own social life, your own career it kind of fixes itself 100 percent. it's it's the it's i inadvertently did exactly what i should have done to get over yes. her mm-hmm. while i was in an attempt to get yeah. her back it doesn't really matter that she was the driving force it doesn't matter that it was the, it was fueled right. by hate and bitterness it was still ultimately <laughs> positive <laughs> exactly totally <laughs> well many great things have been created through hate and bitterness right. so 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 I and let, by trying to impress a woman, by the way. 100%. Have, look at the buildings on Central Park South, the 100-story buildings. You yeah. think that guy has no interest in impressing a woman? Are you making yeah, a phallic yeah. reference, <laughs> a way the buildings These, are shaped? I mean, it's very. So so anyway, I'm back on my feet. I'm over Margie. I'm totally fine. Cut to like three years later. Okay. Everything's been going good, except now I'm kind of like, not into the job I had and I'm kind of like not into like the girls I'm dating and I'm just feeling like a little like eh. and then uh, this is a cautionary tale <laughs> okay amongst cautionary tales okay Margie starts becoming a interest in my mind I'm just like you know Wait, what how I don't I I Basically, it was like we had we at that point, and correct me if I'm wrong. We had started communicating more as friends. And well, like, I was freaking you know. out. I was freaking out. I mean, I was turning thirty, which at now you know that was eighteen oh, years ago. But at the time, I was like, oh my god, I'm turning thirty, and I haven't ever met anyone who loved me the way Andy loved me. And maybe I need to rethink that whole relationship. Maybe there was something there that really wasn't finished. Because, you know, I fucked it up and, okay, let me, let me think. So it wasn't that conscious, but Andy and I were still in touch and he was still really sweet and still really loving and he still saw me in this way and it just started to feel confusing and tempting and I just started feeling drawn back to that, which I think is very similar to what you were feeling at the time, you know, yes. like there's still some feelings there. There was, it was complicated. It wasn't nearly as pure as it was the first round, but there was still a lot of unfinished stuff. Yeah. It was, it was this thing like we had, we finally sort of let ourselves ex- explore like being kind of intimate, not even physically, just like, you just like hanging out in a kind of more intimate way. Yeah. And immediately it was like, Oh, right. We this have this connection. Had. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I remember that. Right. Yeah. So we started kind of like, I don't remember exactly the timeline. You can correct me, Margie, but I think we kind of like maybe slept together and like kind of, it was this weird thing where we were like not really dating and kind of once in a while hooking up and we were friends and we were like, should we do this or not? Blah, blah, blah. And I was kind of like, it sounds all very dramatic. It's very dramatic, (laughs) very dramatic. So then I think it was sometime in 2002, you started dating a guy who I'm now yeah. Facebook friends with. It was a delightful guy, actually. <laughs> but at the time, I'm I like hated a Facebook him. Friend. What was his name? What was, I don't, don't say his name. Don't say his name. No, we just, just say his it. first name. Are you talking about somebody who was sending me a lot of poems back to the poetry? Yes. Yes. I wasn't wow. dating. I wasn't. Margie, you really like <laughs> to stimulate these. There like, was this guy. Poetics. There was this guy. I wasn't was dating this- him, but he was making a hard press. He was like courting me and i think it freaked you out like oh no i'm gonna lose so her she, let's be clear she had dated this guy in college that's a very generous so they, they, term but okay okay but she had whatever <laughs> hooked up with him a few times so i was i was like what the hell like who is this guy i was so pissed off and out of, that pissed off, out of that pissed offness i was like i'm gonna 
I'm gonna land this girl. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. It's I'm gonna. so interesting that you're so fueled by like wanting to get her when these are all signs that you should let her go. Yes, but I was. I was young, experiencing all these things for the first time. Yes, and anyone who experiences. By the way, this is a lesson. I'm not. I'm not tooting my own horn, but I did the trying to get her back thing, and I did the getting back thing. But anyone who does both either and or of those things more than once, shame on you. Yeah. Because I learned my lesson both times very quickly and hard. And never made it yes. that mistake again. So yeah. we got back together. To make a very long story short, we got back together in a in a sort of not a good energy. Unkosher. From my perspective. Unkosher. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, was, it was unclean. So it was. we got back together. We got back together and I literally proposed to her on a dime. Well, I, was wow. like, I, I, I did. I mean, let's be real about it. I, as, a, as somebody who was starting to freak out about, at the time thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be 30. I want to have a family. The only way that I would move in with you was if we were engaged. So I set this ultimatum. Let's be real. I mean, I'm not proud of it now, but I said, yeah. unless we're engaged, I'm not moving in with you. So remember mm-hmm. it was my birthday and you gave me a beautiful birthday present, which was awesome. And then you gave me a ring, which I knew you didn't want to give me. Remember you were like sweating. You were sick <laughs> at the dinner. You were like acting like something was wrong. Do you remember at the restaurant, you didn't eat any of yeah, your food? But like, you didn't want to reason- do it. There was a reason why I was sweating because I brought this ring to this restaurant, which was up on like, what, 125th? It was like a really nice restaurant. I, I forget the name of it. It probably doesn't exist anymore, particularly now. But we went to this restaurant. I had the ring with me. I had the gift. And during the dinner, you, Margie, said mm-hmm. something to the effect of like, I hope you're not planning on proposing to me tonight. <laughs> And I was like, oh, nice, smart, nice, sweet, perfect. <laughs> so, so I remember begrudgingly taking the ring and be like, well, I guess I don't have to give you this. That's oh, how you God. proposed. Well, I mean, it was, it's even, it's, it's like everything that shouldn't, you know, it's like a, a, a story that shouldn't be written, but like, we can't stop trying to write it. You know, like yeah. he, he gave me the ring and I, Andy, you know, this is also not reciprocating of the disc, but I think I said, maybe. When you gave it to me and, mm. and and then I slept on it. And the next morning you and I went out for breakfast at the diner by your Sutton Place apartment. And I said, I thought about it. And the answer is yes. And you redid the proposal. Do you remember you got on your knee in the diner and proposed and everyone in the diner like had a reaction. We made it like yeah, that yeah. was the proposal because there was a lot of confusion for both of us about it. Like we were both yeah. like, yes, I want to do this, but this also doesn't feel you know, it it's doesn't the, quite it sounds, right. Yeah, it sounds like the ultimate just trying to f- make it work, make it mm-hmm. fit, even though it's like yeah. just a I little mean, in, off. In, in retrospect, I think that you and I were really trying to parse through the connection that we felt and still feel on some fundamental level that there is just this love that we have for one another and this appreciation, but it really wasn't the makings of a romantic partnership it really wasn't, but we weren't at that stage of our relationship yet clear about all that. We were just like, okay, I'm supposed to know you. I'm supposed to be connected to you, but is this the way? And we kept trying, but that really wasn't, wasn't right. Mm-hmm. That, do you agree I love with, the honesty with that? in that. Do you, I 100% agree. Yeah. yeah. Everything it's just so said. brutally honest. But, but she did say no when I I think a lot of people time. will just actually will probably listen to this and relate to that, Margie. Yeah, just I mean, that, there's like, just, like, this such is, a deep connection. This is what we should do, right? Like, that we this is the way that we can legitimize the connection we have, the feelings we have, and the love we have for each other. Yeah. It's like, we should get married. Let's get married. I also like, think we, fix it. we were kind of both, like, enveloped by the story of, like, the redemption of it. You know, yeah. like, oh, we've tried this. We failed. We had a break. It was, like, very, and you I know, was, rom-com-y. And I was afraid and, like, separate from anything to do with Andy, like, I think a lot of women can relate that I was putting our relationship within my own timeline and my own fears which was pushing me forward and making me feel like I had to make a choice that I wouldn't have really necessarily arrived at if I wasn't afraid. You know, we might have just mm. gotten back together and dated and seen, but I was really feeling like I need to get married. And I, yeah. I don't think Andy felt any of that pressure that was really coming from me. Totally. That is, I mean, it's hindsight's twenty twenty. I think it's just really valuable to hear that from your mouth, you know, 
and I totally, I feel like I felt that at around 32, with just mm-hmm. that sort of like, mm, you kind of, you feel like you're supposed to be at a certain place and 30 feels at the time old, <laughs> which is now hilarious. It is. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like um, we were different people, but that is really the way that I felt, you know? And I think that so, yeah. much, so much of the relationship, like I said earlier, was about Andy and I trying to be the people that, I'll speak for myself, and you tell me what you think, but trying to be the person that I think I was supposed to become. Like, my parents wanted me to, like, marry a nice Jewish guy, have some kids, you know, like, have this life that could be, you know, they could be proud of. And I think that I was like, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. And there was some part of me that was really kind of, like, not fully on board with that. I was, you know, and I think that Andy felt similarly, like, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is the right thing. This is a a good person. I care about this person. But neither one of us was really ready to sign on for that super traditional lifestyle with one another at that point in our lives. And I think it's just really interesting because when we when we did break up and went on our own separate paths, really, it took both of us another decade, decade and a half before we were each really ready to commit to the kind of partnership we were starting to envision in our 20s. We just weren't there yet. And we had to, I mean, I'll speak for myself again. I had to really figure out who I was. I was not clear on who I was when I was saying I needed to get married at 30. I wasn't there at all. I mean, what you're saying is, I think, again, very valuable because like you're both extremely intelligent and self-aware people. So it says something that you can look back on that and be like, I actually wasn't ready. Because think about how many people who maybe aren't even as self-aware who kind of dive headfirst into something. And yeah, I mean, there were so uh, many lessons after Andy. So many things about like really figuring out the truth of like what I really needed in a partner and who I really was. And none of those things were sorted out. We, We met when we were really, really young, you know. It's not, it reminds me of my big. Andy and I talk about how we have these par- these parallel relationships, mm. and I have my Margie, <laughs> who you know it was an on and off relationship for six years, and mm. I remember Margie feeling that exact way where I was like, should I just like do this? Like maybe I should just marry him, like because I no one else has ever and maybe ever will love me the way he loved me. Mm-hmm. You know, you are so afraid of not being loved in the way that you know this person did, even if there's all of these red flags, all these. It's so problems. scary to let go of that. It is. Yeah. It's very scary. But Margie, in your professional opinion, would you agree with I, this is what I think? That is a terrible reason <laughs> to to try to end up with someone just because out of fear of not being loved like that by someone else. Oh, and absolutely. To me that's, I mean, First of all, any nothing, decision out of fear. You can't ever lose anything. It's something that I've learned. And I don't, I'm sure you guys at this point know what I'm talking about. But the things that are essential in your life, they're going to find their way back to you. Right? Like, you can't really lose them. So if a person, a relationship is really essential, they're going to still be there. Other things that you think, like, you never connected with San Francisco. Okay, you don't have that anymore. But there's so many other things in your life, people, places, loves that you've had that are still part of you. You can't ever really lose them. But I think at the time, like the fear of losing someone can feel so huge that you just feel like I can't bear it. Now, looking back at it, it's like, oh, I let go of that relationship with Andy and I kept the part of the relationship that was the beautiful, whole, mutually gratifying part. And the part that got shed was the part that we didn't need anyway. But I didn't understand that at the time at all. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, part. that's well said. So that final ending, the the engagement ends. In the end, was the ending amicable? Did you end intending to be friends? I think that the ending wasn't amicable, but it was mutual. Margie, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think to summarize it, there was some recalibration of the scales, right? I mean, it wasn't like Andy got me back the way that he originally intended <laughs> it's mm. in your diabolical plotting that I'm only just learning about now. I think that it was, <laughs> I think that it was more that, you know, like we reap what we sow. I got what I had coming back to me. I wasn't 
you know, very good to Andy and the way that it ended in California. And there was a lot of there was a lot of anger and hurt. And that did come back to bite me in the ass. And we ended up, you know, breaking up, which felt right. Like it, it, we both knew by then, like it wasn't working, but it didn't end well. Right. I mean, is that a fair summary? Do you think it didn't end well, but it, it, the end was good. It was good. It that, was a good, it was a good thing. It ended. It was a good it thing. End it ended. Well. We both felt like it needed to end, but it wasn't a like, see you later. so okay on that note because this is a i would say an faq that i received which is how do i you know this person means so much to me and maybe sometimes it's with the interest of like or the ulterior motive of maybe trying to get back together but there's this idea that like can we be friends like how can i be friends with an ex can we make this work can we make this friendship work you guys have made that work History has shown that you've made it work. Even Mm -hmm. with that bad ending, you broke up, you got back together, a broken engagement. There's a lot of pieces on the floor. Could you, could you try to explain why you made it work and, you know, why you think it's possible? Um, I think the, the core of why we are able to be friends now and such good friends is because we started as really good friends we and like each other. The, we like each other as people. Yes. Mm. I really like her. And I remember the first day that I met her, I had no romantic feelings at all. Like, it was just like I met her and I was like, I really like this person. This mm-hmm. is like the first time I've met a, like mm-hmm. a person of the opposite sex where it's so not confusing. I'm just like, I want to be friends with this person. Yeah. She's so cool. And we spent all this time together. And then suddenly I was like, wait a minute, I can have sex with this girl. (laughs) I didn't realize that. So yeah, we were friends to begin with. And when you're friends to begin with. Yeah, and we also always made each other laugh. I mean, I think that even when the relationship was dreadful and we were like just making it, you know, we could make each other laugh. I feel like even right before we broke up, we could still go to the diner and like, crack each other up like there is still a way that we can do that and i know even charlene was saying like we we have a similar sense of humor we have similar neuroses like there's just a there's an understanding that we have right you're very similar people like it's i I find it like i feel like the way the two of you are because you are so similar it could either be like like magnets like it works perfectly because it fits in all the right spots or it's just like and both or magnets it was the other way or both or both yeah. 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 So and it's it's important you you touched on something that's really important. If you're in a relationship where you're laughing a lot together, yeah. I truly believe that no matter what happens, that relationship has an opportunity to become a strong lifelong friendship. If you're in a relationship that is humorless mm. and based solely on like passion and drama and sex, mm-hmm. there's no long term for that. Yeah. No I totally agree with that. Anything else? Any other like bits of advice for anyone who maybe secretly or outwardly wants to maintain a friendship with someone who they may be soon to break up with or have broken up with. To be honest, I I mean, Margie can chime in on this, but I don't think it's up to you. I think it's the nature of the relationship. I I completely agree. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it just either is there or it isn't there. It's not something that if if it's complicated, it's not going to work. It's just not, it, mm-hmm. it really, I think that even though we were going through the whole story and the drama, the, the bi, you know, two part relationship and all of that, the, the point of the story is that by the time we were done, we were clear. Our karma was clear. Mm-hmm. The lessons were learned. I hurt Andy. There were lessons learned. He hurt me. There were lessons learned. And we really didn't resent each other for that. There wasn't mm-hmm. a way that I, we were left holding anger. You know, I have a question. Do you think that you in some way got that clarity because you did give it a second go? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. It took it took two rounds Mm -hmm. to get that clarity. Never would have gotten it without the second round. Okay, always would have haunted you a bit. Absolutely. Interesting. It was healing. It was healing for both of us to come back together and recalibrate everything. And I think like that's just part of me and Andy's story. I think we, mm-hmm. we like in all really powerful re- relationships, we're, we're like teachers for each other, right? These painful ones that rip us apart are also our biggest teachers. 
And I taught Andy stuff and he taught me stuff. And I think that's also part of the reason that we're still friends is because we really treasure that, that we learn so much together. Right. Yeah. She taught me everything I know. (laughs) <laughs> about what to avoid no i'm just kidding <laughs> so oh two God. more two more thoughts on this on the friendship where how much time after that breakup the final breakup did you need before you were able to come together as friends hmm. i think people will want to know the answer to that what do you think Margie? i can't really remember i mean at that point i i was in grad school and i was getting like really focused on finishing up and I think we just parted ways for a nice little chunk of time, but it wasn't something that was like active rejection. It was just getting like picking up each of our respective plot lines. I don't know, a couple mm. years, maybe. I don't know. A couple years. Years. Okay. Couple I years, was, I yeah. wasn't sure if we were talking months or years. Okay. I mean, we didn't ever yeah, like, years. we didn't like not talk. I don't think, but we weren't okay. actually friends. Like we would go out to dinner. I think that was maybe a couple years. Yeah. A couple years. Okay. And then I would say like five, six, seven years later, it was like we were just buds. And was would you say that was regardless of whether one of you or both of you or neither of you were in another happy relationship? Do you think that is it, a factor? It definitely worked better when we were both in, whether they were super happy or not, we were both in serviceable relationships. It was working better. <laughs> okay. right, well, right, Margie? I mean, I think that whether you want to share this or not, um, we were joking a few years ago. Remember, Andy, like in 2014, you met Charlene and I met my now ex. And mm-hmm. we were like, ha- we were talking about what it would be like to write a screenplay of like two people who break up and then like silently race to create a healthy relationship before the other one creates a healthy relationship. <laughs> and so you met Charlene and I met David and then like you, you adopted a cat and then we got kittens and then like you got engaged and we got engaged and we were like, Oh my God, who's going to get to this like healthy state first. You remember we were like, we were yes, saying that our, yes. our inherent, competition was driving the healthiest decisions of our our lives you know but but ultimately your relationship won because you're you really you know you, you found don't know it. you're very you're very no no, her, no well, my I, relationship no, but, but beat the, the first one the first one, the first one. Her, the first her, one. her relationship was okay disaster. david yeah yeah it was yeah, it, okay. it didn't work out it, it was over and as you guys were turning the corner into home base and like getting married david and i were like calling <laughs> yeah. it off so it was like a really we, competitive like baseball game that you, turned yeah. into like a 30 to 10 victory in the Wait, 10th. Wait, was there was this actually a thing or are you just No, like, we joked about it. No, we joked about it. Oh, you did joke should, about it. We should okay. write a screenplay about like how our our future healthy relationships were based on our need to outdo one another in the growth department. You know, like we were joking you about never it. You told me that. Right? Andy, I mean, isn't that something that we talked about? I thought it would have been like brilliant, yeah. a brilliant screenplay. <laughs> but, you know, you won. You won that. So I did eventually catch up by entering into a healthy relationship. Why am I talking about this? What was the initial question? Whether or not, yeah, being in another relationship was helpful, whether I, it's healthy or not, I think, in I terms think, of your friendship. I think to, to sort of summarize well, my feelings about how you become friends with an ex is there's sort of three things that have to happen. One is you have to be good friends to begin with. The relationship, the initial romantic relationship has to be based on friendship, Uh not on sex or you liking the way her face looks or vice versa. The second thing has to be that the breakup has to be somewhat mutual Mm -hmm. or the final breakup in our case. Um, And the third thing I believe is that the two people have to be kind of on similar planes in their life. You know, one person can't be completely dejected in the dumps and one person's on top of the world. But if those things are, if those three things are in alignment, there's no reason why you shouldn't be friends. Um, That being said, as we touched on earlier, I don't think regardless of the relationship, you can just be like, I'm going to be friends with this guy or this girl. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. You just can't force it. It has to be natural. You have to follow that progression yeah excellent that was i mean we went in a lot more detail honestly than i had intended i thought we would sort of just sort of dance around we didn't go into detail detail but i thought we would dance around the timeline and stuff and you guys thank you for being so open i think it helps the takeaway to know exactly what happened there well i think it's interesting it's interesting for us too i mean i find it interesting 
to think yeah. about all these years There's, later, like how did we get here and why does it work and why doesn't it work with some people? I find it interesting. It is because I mean, I know myself, I'm friends with, I'd say two, mm-hmm. two exes, mm-hmm. but they were, you know, to agree with you, they were the two that I had the best friendships with, you know, mm-hmm. I laughed the most with those yep. two. Humor. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and don't you think it has something also to do with just like true forgiveness? You know, like when you reach a point in the relationship at the breakup, if you truly. But I think, I think, I think that has to do a lot with the person getting on with their life and getting their, you know, being confident and strong in their own existence. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's easy to forgive fully when your life is a mess. Agreed. So, so that's kind of like part of, but I agree, but it's part of, in my opinion, part of the third leg of mm-hmm. how you remain friends. I totally agree with that. And I mean, that yeah. gets back to the whole, you know, what everyone always says, you need to know who you are. You need to work on yourself. You need to love yourself before you can truly hmm. find love. It's and all, all that stuff. it's all corny, but it's totally true. It, There's mm-hmm. a reason why it's corny. Was yeah. it said so many times? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to take advantage of Margie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we cannot let you go as a professional <laughs> <laughs> uh, and not ask your opinion. You know, you, you have mm-hmm. patients. You are a psychologist. You probably talk about other people's relationships all the time, mm-hmm. multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. so my question for you is what do you think the most common mistakes people make in dating today it's basic but there's many layers i feel like to this answer i mean i think we've kind of inadvertently touched on some just in going over our story but i mean i'll try to just summarize really quickly but then there's no rush there's no rush you just you let it let us okay (laughs) well you know, you guys were talking about loving yourself and all of that. You know, one of the ways that I think about it is from my own learning is just really one mistake that people make is by not giving themselves enough time. This is definitely something that I did feeling a pressure, especially like with, you know, um, biological clock ticking and whatever else you start to really, it's a real thing to start to feel Mm -hmm. pressure and to feel rushed And I think that when you really give yourself permission to take your time to really become someone that you like, somebody that you enjoy being with a life that you enjoy having, you will attract somebody that you like. If you're someone you like, you will attract someone that you like. And if you're not Mm -hmm. yet there with yourself, that's really okay. Just take your time and get there. And I, I didn't know that then, and I wish I had, but I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make. Mm. Does that make sense? I mean, I've been, yeah, I mean, it makes so much sense. I feel, uh, I mean, when you talk about the biological clock as a woman, I have been in that exact spot where I was like, well, I've p- invested this much time. And even though there's these things that I aren't, ex- they're, they're not really, are they breakup worthy? Are they worth throwing everything away for? You know, and you're feeling this, clock and you're like well it's probably fine like how how much do you really need to know you know this you could sort of allow yourself to be shoved Mm -hmm. and when you can shove yourself rather in a certain direction prematurely and wouldn't you each Mm -hmm. agree that part of the reason that you were able to find one another was because you actually reached a point within yourselves it wasn't like your life was perfect but you liked yourself. You were in a good place. Like you, you, you felt pretty good about you yourself. See, you can't see me right now, but I'm giving you mm. big like reaction to that because mm. I completely agree. Timing, timing, timing is, is everything. everything. Ooh, yeah, time. everything. Yes. And when you line that up was, with when you line up with yourself, and you know it. Everybody knows what that feels like when you arrive within yeah. yourself, and you're just kind of living in the heart of who you are, being authentic. You just start to attract the right people and the right things. And if you're not there, you know it too. And so give yourself the time to get there. It's a worthwhile process, right? That, that would be- I would say there's probably very few processes, processes, mm-hmm. processes? Processes. Processes. There are very, probably very few processes that are less worth it than that. 
Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay. Wow, that was a good one. Okay, give us more, Margie. Okay, more. Um, more wisdom. Other le- other <laughs> the mistakes people make in relationships. Okay, so like once yeah, or in dating, yeah, or in dating. Well, okay. Another mistake I think people make is to not give themselves a chance when they're dating somebody and they like them and they feel connection to not give it the chance to actually reach a point of conflict. You know, like I think Mm. it's not that you want to seek out conflict with your partners, but it's important to test whether the relationship has the capacity for growth. If you can't resolve a conflict with the other person, if they're not capable of saying, I'm sorry, if they're not capable of seeing things through your perspective and you seeing things through their perspective, you're not really going to be able to grow together and you have to be able to fight. You have to be able to resolve conflict. So I really, I feel like people need to have some of that unrest. They have to have the struggle and see where it, where it goes and what it produces before they can say, yes, this person is a long-term person. Yes. Yep. I mean, I got to fight. You got to fight. Yeah. If you do not fight well, you will not last. And Margie. Period. So we have these episodes with happy couples that we call love fests. Mm-hmm. And we've had two so far and Andy with both of them separately. And we, it's funny cause we haven't like, we haven't talked about this. We haven't talked about what you're talking about, mm-hmm. but and now I'm realizing where that question comes from, because how do you fight? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, what the question really is, is how do you resolve conflict? Right. And it's so And there's lots important. of ways to do it. Like there, it's not that I'm sitting here saying like, you need to sit down as two Zen masters and just share your feelings. No, you can have a blowout fight, do whatever, but is it productive? Are the two mm. of you able to get somewhere new and, and resolve things that are not working? Because you're going to yeah. face that. You're going to have those moments. So healthy, th- healthy resolution. Yeah. Healthy resolution. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and what you're saying is that it's not necessarily one path. It doesn't have to be a certain fighting style. It could be, like you said, a blowout fight as long as it's not like you're back at square one every single time. Yeah. You should grow with every fight. Right, you, should, you should be learning something from it. You should be adjusting and changing and growing and mm-hmm. feeling out what, what does this relationship require? Really, what is the relationship asking of us? And if that's not yeah. happening, you're not going to make it, you know? Yeah, it's like if you live, if you like, if you like live in like the woods somewhere and you get, you get familiar with your, your neighborhood, you're like, oh, this is a place where there's like a snake that lives. <laughs> this is a place where there's poison ivy. <laughs> This is a place where I'll trip over this log every single time and like sprain my ankle. Right. And you eventually are just like, oh, I can avoid all these things. Not that hard. You know, you know what you sound like? It's like a placemat that you draw in with crayons at a family restaurant. Oh, totally. That's exactly <laughs> the way I was thinking about it. It's like you're drawing how you're going to like avoid all these pitfalls. Yeah, it's like a really like a very simplistic cartoon of a, of a wilderness area. <laughs> yeah. There's real truth in that. Okay, it's Margie. True, any, but it's more? true, though. You're going to reach a point where you're going to have the same fights and you do have to understand them. It's, it's totally true. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. So other mistakes people make. Um, again, like I said, all of these are learned from experience. Um, <laughs> like really, you know, learning that you can't change someone and that, you know, so many times in relationships in my history, I've just reached a point where I'm like, okay, this person would be great if I could just change this one thing or if they could just mm. learn this thing <laughs> or stop doing that thing, then the relationship would work. And, you know, yep. it's just, yep. I could, I could talk for an hour on just this one point. Honestly, I won't, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, you know, this is to me like the hugest, most important lesson really yep. is to understand that we cannot change other people. Other people are beautiful and perfect as they are. They don't exist to be who we need them to be. You know, that's not, yep. that's not the way love works. And in fact, if you think that you're frustrated by people not being who you need them to be, you need to evaluate whether you really love this person because that's not really love, that's gratification. Like, I need them to be who I need, who I need them to be. That's not really love, you know? And love is about loving somebody who's not exactly who you need them to be and, and loving them anyway. But understanding that you can't make people different is a really liberating thing. And, and here's the, mm-hmm. the second piece, which is, I think, you know, kind of magical and important. 
you can't change other people, but when you're in a partnership with somebody and you want it to change, if you change, if you're willing to change yourself, you can change the relationship and thereby change the person. But that's not because you changed them. It's because you allowed mm-hmm. yourself to be part of that change and then things can change. But that's, you know, you can't just say, I need you to be different. Mm-hmm. Does that, does it make yeah. sense? Yeah. Fixer uppers for houses, not people. <laughs> <laughs> Fixer uppers are for I love that show. No, Charlene loves that I, show. I have a that, huge thing. I love that show. <laughs> I mean, Joanna Gaines is half Asian, so you don't see many That's half enough. Asians on TV. So I'm like, ah. <laughs> and she's so talented. But yeah, Fixer Upper, I have made Andy watch more than one episode of that show. <laughs> it's a good show. It is a great show. Satisfying. Fixer uh, uppers and, and also just like the entitlement around like, I need you who I need. I need you to be who I need you to be for me. Like that kind of. A, yes, it's well put. That kind of approach isn't really going to work. Um, and I've and been it, there. Like, I remember thinking that. And I, for me, it came to the point where it was, I, I'm pr- pretty sure I can't change you. I'm not sure. Like, I've tried for a while. And, and then it's just, well, I know that I need things that this person has proven to me that they are incapable of changing to fit. And therefore, it was, for me, something I sought in future relationships. What I learned from that relationship was what I needed based on having not received it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think like we learn as we go through all the things that aren't working, right? Like this is what Absolutely. doesn't work and this is what I really need. And I need, you know, more of that and less of this, which actually gets to yeah. the next mistake I was going to make, which is, you know, something that I think it might sound cynical, but it's truly, it's not. It's just that I think a lot of people have this idea that true love is unconditional and that, you know, when you love somebody, it just, that's all that matters and everything will work because we love each other. You know, you might love somebody for the rest of your life. That doesn't mean the relationship will work, you know, and that adult relationships are not like parent child relationships. Like when a parent loves a child, it really is unconditional, right? Like you just accept this child, but when you're in a partnership with someone, you don't have to accept everything they do because you love them and they don't have to accept everything that you do because they love you. And I think really understanding that there is a conditional aspect to adult partnership is a, is a way to really help couples operate yeah. with more respect towards one another. Oh, yeah, that it's is a choice. so good. Yes. And, then, and I feel like so many people often like test, they test their partner. Like how much do you love me? They sort of are testing the boundaries and like you yes. said, try to change it change them um, to, to kind of see just how unconditional it is when really that's maybe not territory or maybe it is territory you want to go to, but you may not get the answer you want. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're in a really comfortable relationship with somebody, especially if you haven't ever had that with somebody who really makes you feel safe and makes you feel loved, it can be tempting kind of unconsciously to just go into more like a child a childlike place where you begin to regress and act kind of terrible. And, and that's not, that's, they don't, they shouldn't accept that. They shouldn't, it's not good for the relationship. It's, so it's one thing to be caring and loving for one another, but to just expect your partner to take whatever you dish out is not a fair expectation. Yeah, You gotta, you gotta stay likable. <laughs> <laughs> And take responsibility, stay, stay you know? Stay cool, man. Stay cool. Stay That's cool. a good hashtag. <laughs> stay likable. Yeah. It's like um, it's like the most interesting man in the world. Like, what does he say? What is it? Something the Dos Equis What star? does he say? Yeah, what does he say? He says, stay something. I don't know. Uh, we can always add it in. Anyway, Yay, podcast. We'll figure that out later. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Gabby. I'm like, another asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> stay thirsty. They, really? Stay There's thirsty. no relevance to what I said. <laughs> So let's ask that. My point is, you got to be cool. Okay. Got to stay like cool. Be cool, and you can't right. ex- and you can't expect somebody to come along and make you cool and rescue you and put you together. You have to kind of do that part yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Any other gems? You know, there's like this. There's a famous phrase that my hero, one of my heroes, Mr. Rogers. I don't know if your listeners are are too young to know Mr. Rogers, but he said this brilliant thing. He said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. 
And I just love that because it means that anything is okay as long as you can talk about it. It's just that you need to be able to talk about it and work it through and work through whatever it is. You got to be able to talk to your partner. So if you're yes. afraid, if you're afraid to bring things up with someone, that's something you really have to think about because you got to be able to. That in and of right? itself is a problem. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in the early days of our relationship, there was something I noticed that was different about us than in prior relations if I had had. Mm -hmm. And that is that the relation, the importance of the relationship always took precedence over everything else. So in other words, if we got into a fight, whereas in the past, I might be like, I'm going to hold on to this. Like, I'm going to go to sleep with this. I'm going to hold it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. She's never getting away with this one. Yeah. Like, with or you us, just hold, yeah, it's just a grudge, even if you're like, oh, I'll let it go. But no, but you down, really don't like, let it go. Yeah. You sort of just acquiesce. Yeah. I was always thinking like, whatever it is, the relationship, it's like the queen bee, you know, it's like nothing else matters, protect the queen. Yeah. And it was always about protecting the relationship, mm -hmm. no matter how, mm -hmm. even if I was like resolute, like I am right and she is wrong. I was like, is it really important enough to cause a fracture? Mm. And it wasn't ever. So I think that's the secret to everything right there, truly, is that you put the we above the I. At a certain point, mm -hmm. you just are willing to say, even though I'm angry, even though I'm hurt, um, this we is the drink is the cup that we both drink from and we want to keep it filled. And if I, if I'm yep. vengeful or spiteful, I'm not going to have anything to drink. So let's keep <laughs> nourishing this cup, you know? Oh, you really, you really kept that metaphor going without <laughs> like any it? mixed Does metaphor. I, yeah, yes. I carried it really all the way committed. through. She drove it all the way across the finish line. <laughs> well done. All awesome. right. Cool. <laughs> uh, that was just delightful. That was great. Thank you so much, Margie, for being such a willing, <laughs> willing guest. No, willing subject. Well, I think I can also speak to, to people who may be frustrated in their relationships, you know, and feeling like they're not where they want to be. And, you know, you're learning, even if you feel like what on earth, like I, I can't, I can't attract a healthy partner. I can't have a good relationship. You're learning so much right now. Like that's really what mm -hmm. I was doing during that whole period with Andy and through throughout my early thirties, was just learning and learning and learning. And it all really, you know, helped me. So I think, I wouldn't like you guys agree that that was like the best learning you ever had was all the stuff that was miserable. Of all course. the mistakes that we made, every mistake. Yeah, I you don't like learn from not making mistakes. You, you, you're all your learning comes from mistakes. I feel everything like and everything. Don't value that enough. They don't value the learning enough. Mm -hmm. It's all about the output, the result, the productivity. Mm -hmm. But these lessons are just so invaluable and they're yeah. so, th you know, they're kind of thankless. It's not like everyone's like, good job, you learned a lot. No, lesson. well, I, you know, this is what I always like, I don't know guys, women have come to me for advice many times who have been in a breakup or involved in a bad relationship. And it's usually like someone who just got broken up with or, and they're miserable. Yeah. And I'm always like, okay, listen, I was in the same place. I know exactly how you feel. Like mm -hmm. every, you're not really even listening to what I'm saying because you're so like self-absorbed in your own misery. Mm. You have to listen. This is going to be the best part of your life. Like this is where it begins. Like yeah. you just started. Mm -hmm. And as much as that sounds really annoying on the receiving <laughs> end, it's a hundred percent true until you've mm -hmm. had your heart like ripped out and yeah. just thrown in a campfire. Mm -hmm. You're not going to really be the full person that you're destined to be. And as an example, you know, this relationship, which is so rock solid that I can have this memory lane conversation mm -hmm. with my ex fiance, who which, I, which by the way was my idea, which was her idea, <laughs> who I taking credit for, that. who I, I, yes, it was your good bravo, um, who I deeply loved and I still love, and I know that when this is over, we're not going to have a fight about this. No, and that's that's the crux of it right there. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Feels pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the relationship where that would not be the case. So oh, have yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. There, well, there would all, be broken and, plates. And Margie, been, so have you. Yeah. Yeah. We've all been yeah. through the ringer and that's part of the reason that we can do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, on that note, yes, on that note, I think that's the perfect place to close. 
Margie, thank you. That was awesome. I mean, I intend to have you back. Let us know, listeners. I, I think Margie... The <laughs> it's a bottomless pit of wisdom there. <laughs> so uh, if you are ever you willing, we will have you back anytime to talk uh, more about mistakes people make. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hey. my pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much Thanks. for joining us. Thank you, guys. This was really, really fun. So that's it for this unique episode of Do Shandy. I loved that. It's great. Yeah. It's great catching up with her. It was. And I feel like you guys even talked about things that maybe you have never discussed. I mean, we have definitely not recapped that ever. Really? So it was pretty unique. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, I feel like we talked enough. And so we're just going to wrap right here. That's it. It's Call. enough. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we give you mercy. We give you mercy. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in to Dear Shandy. Hopefully that was interesting to you. Maybe you learned something. I know... I did. There was, it was definitely a little cathartic to hear some of her lessons. Like if, mm-hmm. if my She's good. 10 or 15 years ago self had heard that, I wonder if, yeah. You would have not listened and you would have made those mistakes. Probably. And, <laughs> and like you said, the beauty is in those lessons being learned. Mistakes so. are beautiful. So thank you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed this, by all means, you can like it, subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell, I can't think of any other things you would do to show your love for Dear Shandy, but whatever you can do to help us grow, we would appreciate it. And on that note, thank you. (laughs) We'll see you next time. Bye.